Thanks for tuning in. Before we start the show, we have an announcement to make. We got gear for you. Yeah, due to popular demand, we've got some proper nice t-shirts with our famous logo on the front. We've even got two star with caps. We've got the trucker cap and the best-selling uh, lazy slouch adjustable cap. And more importantly, we've got a beer mug, a whiskey glass, and a coffee mug to go. So you can be listening to our podcast no matter what you're doing, whether you're having a cigar at night or you're on your way to work. So you can pick up whatever you like there. Mike, where can they find it? All you got to do is go to freakstrength.com slash shop, freakstrength.com. Click on the shop. Once you click on shop, pictures are going to show up of our merchandise. Click those pictures right there. There you have it. Mike and Brooker show merchandise right there. Scroll right down. Order whatever you can to support the show. Show everyone that you are avid listeners of the Mike and Brooker show. Yeah. Show, you, show yourself as an original disciple of the show. And guys, we just want to thank you once again for the love and support. It means the world to us. But in order for us to keep doing this, we need to keep receiving feedback. So no matter what it is, good, bad, or ugly, we're open to everything. We want to keep delivering the best information possible. So thanks once again for all the love, and we hope to hear from you soon. Thanks, guys. All right. And we are rolling. Brooker, why, why, don't, you, why don't you give the intro for him? Yeah, so Keir went and flat. So we met each other back in 2010, 2011. When you were, what was you? Was you the academy coach for London Wasp or still the intern? Yeah, 10 to 11, I was the intern. 11 to 12, I was the assistant. 12 onwards, I was the head. Yeah, and what a whirlwind of a career you've had, man. I mean, I've not been checking in on you that much, but I've known some of the big stuff you've done. We saw each other five years ago in Oz. Yeah. That was when you were at the Sydney Roosters back in the uh, oh, Sunny no, Bill Williams was, days. Uh, that was after the, uh, the disastrous stint. <laughs> oh, was it? Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> And, uh, and since then, man, you've done basically everything in the rugby game. You know, you went from uh, academy, academy work up to, where did you go? Rochester as well. Oh, actually, why don't you go on? You know your history better than me. I went to Rotherham. Um, you know, I've kind of said other, other places that strategically I was not content to be the academy guy because that has a lot of implications for what you earn and how you're treated. And I could see myself being put into that box. So I looked for other opportunities that were actually less money, but I thought had a higher ceiling. So I was at Rotherham for a little bit, knowing that I was going to move to Australia. I filled in as a, a temporary um, coach for Exos with the Argentinian national team, which is some of the most profound luck that I've had in my career, but that I planted the seeds for not knowing it. That led to the Sydney Roosters, which was just an all-round disaster and uh, an expensive lesson. And then, again, more dumb luck. I was my own replacement for Argentina, which culminated in the 2015 World Cup. And I got recruited to go to the Japan Top League. I did a couple of years in Japan selling my soul for money. And I thought, I don't enjoy this rugby anymore. I'm going to go work in the NFL. And I've been in the States for almost two and a half years yeah man fantastic yeah. it's been two and a half years now january 18 yeah i uh i finished in japan i think let me think i i left japan january 15th i touched down in london on the 16th had a bender for portland's 30th birthday i spent a day recovering i had a day with my family and then i flew to america that was the turnaround. And I was at work on the Monday. Oh, shit. Yeah. I can't, I can't but, believe you've been here that long. Yeah. How, wait, how long, how long have I been in uh, Side Chick now? I can't tell you, dude. I don't even know how long that, that chat's been going. <laughs> I don't know how it started, but it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a, a thing to behold. We need to get Brooker on there. <laughs> He's, he's never, he's, he can't be bothered. He's not even on, on Instagram. I've, I've been yelling at him for, since we've been doing the podcast, he finally just started posting about it. The Dude, Brooker's, Brooker's Instagram, there was a period where he went full motorcycle diaries and he somehow just broke the algorithm because every post I got was just like, oh, Brooker on a motorcycle. Oh, Brooker <laughs> on another motorcycle. I was like, God damn, how's he done this? Man, I didn't understand the rules. People got so upset. Like, this is not the way you use Instagram. You upload one picture at a time. And I would just be 30. 
<laughs> so then I was like, fuck it, man. I can't be bothered with this. Yeah. Stuff. But no, but Keir, man, like one of the cool things that, you know, that I love about you, man, is that you've not just done the scene in terms of, you know, professional jobs. You also deep down like a hustler and you've managed to get something serious going in terms of web platforms and setting up other things. And, you know, for me, like you're, you're more entrepreneurial than you are just sort of a strength coach. And that's one of the things that I really, uh, you know, respect about you, man. So where's that right now? Like all your, your platform. I mean, I know you've got strength coach network. What's that about rugby strength coach? Is it all the same thing or what's going on? Well, I, I'll say, you know, the first thing is that poverty is a very uh, powerful motivator. Mm. So as an adult male, having to uh, do a full-time internship and ask my dad for money is a humiliating experience. And I promised myself at the end of that internship, I'll never, as a grown man, have to ask anyone for money ever again. Um, do you remember Neto? Yeah. I got my card declined at Neto. That's how <laughs> poor I was. <laughs> think think yep. of like Food Lion, Gudango, getting your card declined at Food Lion. And it, it was out of necessity that I had done programs for people super cheap. And when you commute best part of an hour each way, you know, I'm, I'm a real junk self improvement fan and. Tony Robbins, Seth Godin, all these different people. So those were the seeds during the intern internship year of I'm losing money and I have to stop losing money. And I'd done general population. I trained people in person, you name it, I would train them. And did that for a couple of years. And I think maybe in my second or third year, it got to the point where I was actually making more from the side than I was from the job, which speaks volumes about how poorly paid the job was rather than the success of the, the business. Um, and I would, you know, my, my very first website was training by uk, which is trash because it's so vague. It tells you nothing and it locks me into the business. So, as my career had started to develop within the professional ranks, I realized that people are only coming to me to ask questions about rugby for the most part, and they only care about rugby stuff. They want to know what it's like to work with this team, this team, this team. And I got back from uh, Argentina the first time where I was the temporary guy. And I was like, fuck, what do I do for money? And I'd, I'd read a quote about niche, which is, trying to make money via a business is like trying to start a fire with a magnifying glass. So you can move it around all you want, but you're never going to get the, that focused heat that leads to the fire. So I thought people only ask me about rugby. If you look at me, I don't look like an Instagram model. I only have credibility based on my knowledge and experience in rugby. And is there any competition within the rugby space? You can say rugby renegade. I'll give them a free shout out because I think their stuff is trash. So no, <laughs> rugby strength coach. And although measuring Facebook likes is a poor way to measure the success of a business in four years of beg, borrow, steal, please like my page, 750 likes, four years, one day of rugby strength coach, 1500 likes. So that gives you an, uh, an indication as to the value of niche. And again, making a lot of mistakes, it was like, well, you know, online coaching, uh, products, services, all that kind of for players. But as you grow, you realize that one, my influence isn't just going to be limited to rugby just because I interact with a lot of different people on the internet and, and stuff like that. And it's, it's kind of puts you in a box because people see rugby strength coach and they think, Oh, there's only going to be to do with rugby. And I came to a realization about 2014, 15, which is primarily people are going to buy based on emotion. People buy an emotion, then they rationalize with logic afterwards. If that was not the case, Louis Vuitton handbags would not exist because you can get a canvas tote bag and then it works just as well, right? 
So people are typically going to buy based on emotion and they're going to buy more to avoid pain than they are to seek gain. Now, the conundrum with rugby player focused products and services is if, if you're really, really good, you're going to go pro and you're going to get that for free. And if you're really, really bad, you know it and you don't give a fuck. So you have this tiny window of people that are just on the fringe that will invest in themselves in the hope of making it, or you have pushy parents. But regardless, it's a seasonal product. Mm. They really care in preseason, and then they forget who you are in season, repeat. Okay? So that led to the development of more of a coach education platform. So they're all right. Is there more motivation and more pain amongst strength coaches to educate themselves and get ahead of the competition relative to amateur rugby players? You better believe there is. People really want to get ahead in a highly competitive field. So they will put their hands in their pocket for good advice and good educational materials that actually matter in the real world as opposed to a degree or a UKSCA. So that was what led to <clears throat> what was initially called the rugby strength coach community. But again, you know, what's in the name? realized 75 to 80 percent of my members have nothing to do with rugby so i created that division so now their strength coach network which is the tag is you know where strength coaches come to learn and rugby strength coach is just the, the products and services which we continue to produce so the strength coach network the, the gist of it is monthly educational lectures by coaches that work at the elite level they have to have skin in the game they have to make they have to feed their families with getting results they present on a topic that's pertinent to the field that people can use on Monday morning. But you, you guys know, is knowledge, skills and experience predictive of success in the field? No. You also have to be strategic in your career development and you have to be financially robust to the vagaries of the field. So that's where we add in additional support and advice for coaches so that we're, we're trying to produce coaches that are complete in their development that are robust to the field. Because when you're in such a highly oversubscribed field, a few things are like to happen. One is <clears throat> you'll, you'll struggle for so long, so hard that you'll run out of money and you'll give up. Another is if all three of us are going for the same job, he'll do it for 100, I'll do it for 99, you'll do it for 98, and we just go round and round and round in a race to the bottom. You can separate yourself a little bit on that by not competing on price, but you do have to accept that the wages in this field are going down, not up. So you have to counteract that. And really, there is a massive problem in this field of people will, in general, humans will orient their behavior to what, towards what gets rewarded and measured. So the reason you have a field full of morons in tight polo shirts headbutting players in their helmets is because in their head, they've associated the media attention that comes from that with job success. Because Scott Cochran did that and Alabama won and Scott Cochran got paid. And then administrators and head coaches will say, get me a Scott Cochran. And there's a bunch of people in the field that go, I can do that. And then they'll do that. Now, people are welcome to do that if they want, but they have to understand that when you play that game, you become extremely expendable and you're going to have to make, uh, if you're sufficiently intellectual, compromises to your approach. So the more money you have on the side coming in, the more free you can be in your actions, uh, your thoughts and your words because the business that has one customer is one firing away from ruin and is run by an idiot and you're in the business of you. So it's great <clears throat> that these coaches get paid X hundred thousand dollars a year, but they're expected to play a role and they're expected to shut their mouth and do certain things that if they're really intellectually honest, don't make any scientific sense and they're dumb. But if they don't play the game, they don't get the money. So that's the long, the long answer. Was that too long? No, bro, it was good. I cool. thought it was good. Good rundown. Good rundown. So what's the, what are you hoping to, to do with this? Are you hoping to continue to scale it? Are you looking to sort of take a step back from it? I mean, you're a busy man. 
what's the what's the sort of ideas truthfully I, I want to put the UK SE out of business cool yeah I like that because cool. you know don't tell me about the pain of labor just give me the baby what is wrong with coach education from from our standpoint you know James will talk about sport as a whole from the physical preparation domain there's a huge disconnect between what we are taught at the postgraduate level, what the accrediting bodies say is important and what actually is. So it needs to come from those individuals working in the field to demand. We want coaches that can do this, 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 as opposed to experts in VO2 max, uh, potentiation, broomstick snatches, all this bullshit. So there, there's a disconnect there. And I, I can complain about that all I want, or I can put out there what I believe needs to be there. Yeah. And I want to continue to grow the membership and continue to put out good stuff that helps people in their careers and takes on momentum. And so and they can buy it from me. <laughs> so, so would you say your motivator now is not so much educating athletes, but educating coaches? Is is is? Oh, of course, of course. So yeah. you'd you'd rather be the guy educating coaches now than training the athletes? Ultimately, if you had to pick between the two, training athletes is a hobby, whereas what what do I feel has the most purpose? Is, is training coaches because ultimately you talk about like what, what are the, the most powerful levers of change? You know, you don't want to be rearranging the deck chairs and the Titanic about, oh, you know, their A skips are so good. Yeah, but their coach just blew them out of the water with 10,000 yards of running and this amount of high speed running and we're going to do it again tomorrow. We're going to do two a days and stuff like that. You can think of plenty of examples of, of sports teams who have what you know we would say average physical preparation. We've, we've spoken about a couple of them. Mm -hmm. Average physical preparation, but there are so many factors outside of that that make up for average physical preparation in terms of an organizational culture, um, recruitment and training of staff, recruitment of athletes, um, technical tactical preparation and so on. So sufficient development in those areas will erase any mistakes in physical preparation in terms of the overall result mm -hmm. the reverse is not true there are teams out there with fantastic physical preparation programs where the other stuff is not in order that lose yeah so it, this is not to say it's not important but there are other things which are more important which a lot of teams just get that by accident it would be great to do it on purpose because then it becomes repeatable and you can iterate and improve. And, and also it's more of like, um, it's an accurate way to view leadership in the field because like a headmaster is not responsible for the grades of the students. He's responsible for the performance of the teachers and the teachers are responsible for the grade of the students. Right. So, I mean, if you want to impact athletes and help, pro you know, progress the field, the best way you can do it is actually educate the coaches in the, in your philosophy and then let them do their thing with the guys. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And I think we have instinctively figured it out. So with the exception of, um, Let's, let's take college sport off the table. If you look at pro sport, both in America and outside of America, who gets paid the most? The owner. Because guess what? You, you can control for inadequacy or inefficiency across the organization at best or below you. You are not going to change people this way. If you're my intern and I have severe uh, deficiencies in my role, am I going to listen to you and do as you tell me? No. So ultimately, the owner becomes the most powerful person in the organization because they're able to select every other person below them and they answer to you. So if the person at the top has a clear enough model of reality, understands, you know, these are the things that are going to influence success, 
these are the qualities that underpin that. Here's how we measure those qualities and here's how we recruit and train them. Then that's hugely powerful. You can put anyone you want in as a strength coach. Then it's going to be stuff like GM, then it's going to be head coach and it's going to be head of player recruitment because, you know, instinctively we figured it out. These are the most powerful jobs in the organization. They deserve the most money because they're having the most powerful influence on outcome. Yeah. I can guarantee you Bill Belichick's been through more than one strength coach, but there's, there's one Bill Belichick. <laughs> and you, you see the same with teams that have a massive swing in fortunes from year to year. The strength coach typically doesn't change. It's the stuff that way that changes. And that's the stuff that has power, the most powerful implication. And it would be great to be able to approach that not necessarily me, but for organizations to approach that in a deliberate way, because success is wonderful. But if you succeed by accident, you know, that's, that's not sustainable. You, you want to look at, you know, what's that kind of like dynasty approach to success and then copy those teams. So you're really, you're really inspired by James, by James's uh, global sport con concepts then. Massively, massively. Yeah. I think the, the, the stumbling block with that is going to be, it's tough to change a system without being inside the system. And the fundamental barrier that I've uh, come across is one, they don't want to listen to the strength guy and two, they don't want to listen to the rugby guy. So you can, you can tell it how it is and it's not going to get off the ground. So I think it's, I'm, I'm not sure how you solve that question, but I mean, maybe, maybe just tear it down from, from within and start again. <laughs> but yeah, he's, he's right. He's right. So, so that's, that's where I always struggle. Yeah. Um, because uh, my, my passion is to work with the athlete, mm -hmm. right? I, and even within my business, I own the business. I fucking hate being the manager. The business <laughs> owns you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> well, but but it's it's because I don't like managing. That's I don't cool. I don't you know what I mean? Like I don't like the oversight, but because I have the knowledge, I have a and and I'm the one in power, I have the responsibility to do the oversight. So like that it's and it's almost as if I'm working backwards in a sense by going to school for for the acupuncture because yeah. now I make myself more man to man rather than more man to yeah, that's, 10 men. That's okay. That's okay. Because if you, if you read about tech, for example, because it, it, you're going to, you're going to learn a lot more about these companies that are public and that everybody writes about compared to say a sporting organization. But you talk about CEOs, you know, people say, Oh, like he's a product CEO does Mark Zuckerberg care about the legal shit and marketing? No, because he might be one of those like lizards in disguise. <laughs> he cares about making a better product. So I, I think I forget the guy's name, but I, I went to a, a business event once where a guy said, do what you do best, delegate the rest, whatever it is you enjoy, you're going to, you're going to be the best at and you're going to be the most productive. But if it is your baby, you have a, a duty to yourself and to the business to try and put people in place that do that other stuff well to allow you to focus on the stuff that you enjoy. Yeah. It's Which the five percent is the five percent rule, isn't it? You want to be focusing only on the five percent of the stuff that only you can do and you can do best. Yeah. I I uh I really like Peter Thiel. Yeah. I I recommend everyone reads Zero to One because some of the things you read in that book are so counterintuitive, but actually make sense, which is, you know, competition is for losers. All great businesses are built on a secret that you know that nobody else knows. Um, and really, like you said, that 5% or that, that leverage, the Pareto principle. He, allegedly, when they were building PayPal, he had a, a, a role that you were responsible for. Everybody had their job. And if you tried to come up and speak to him about anything to do anything not to do with that, he would just walk past you like he didn't exist. Can you imagine if colleges and professional sports teams had 
that level of focus. It would be unreal because, you know, in Japan, I used to, Japan, Japanese professional rugby is community sport in disguise with a lot of money. <laughs> oh, we're, we're going to go to the gates of the factory and hand out flyers for the games. Why? What's our goal? Our goal is to win rugby games. How does this help us win rugby games? Well, no. Conversation over. And that's why they didn't like me. <laughs> Tough, but true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so now you're, you're a college strength coach and you're working to become a higher level or higher paid college strength coach, whether it's power five, NFL, whatever, whatever the fuck, right. That you're looking yeah. for that next. I would, I would like to, I'm not going to, uh, not going to work myself to death or not be able to look in the mirror, but I would like to. And what are you hoping to accomplish with those? It's terrible. It's just to prove I'm the best. That's why it's just straight ego. Yeah. And, and what would be your, your measurables to. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't. That's the problem. It, it is, you know, I, th I think we were off air when we said it, but it's such a fine balancing act to, I forget where I read it. I think I read a, a quote from somebody that had um, bipolar disorder and they said, would, you know, if you could have your time again, would you give up having um, bipolar disorder? And he said, once you've walked with angels, you'll tolerate the demons. So coaching is really tough personally from a lifestyle and it, it can be very very tough to do day in day out but then every now and then you'll get these little things in your career like walking out to Wembley behind your team 90,000 people going absolutely nuts at the World Cup and then that melts away and you forget and you've bought yourself another year of shit right <laughs> so it's very very tough to have the kind of drive and focus and ego and selfishness that helps you to achieve that because you're going to need it whilst at the same time remembering that you're a human being and not losing sight of that and ultimately if you spend 10 years eating shit and moving around the world and starting again what do you have at the end of it because I tell you what, if you, if you keep doing that again and again and again, and then you get fired, what have you got to show for it? Oh, here's a team that I used to work for. Yeah. So I wouldn't say it was an epiphany, but having a child and he's going to be two in November, he doesn't even know what sport is yet. He doesn't care. He cares about, is he going to see me? What kind of person am I? All that kind of stuff. Am I showing him love? So I think... Maybe, maybe there's a, a transition there in terms of the career. I think, I, like you, I very much enjoy sport. I very much enjoy training athletes. At times, I've been accused of being an extrovert. Um, I enjoy going fucking nuts in a room full of, you know, 80, 80 guys. But there's definitely a shelf life on it because I don't want somebody else raising my son. I don't want for someone just to click their fingers and that's it. What I, what I do every day is gone. Yeah. And I want to try and have like a meaningful contribution to the field uh, that I think makes a difference. So Strength Coach Network is, is partly that, but I'm not gonna limit myself to sport. You know, I'd, I would love to do something else. I've actually given myself the, the, the time limit of I'm gonna be 40. So I will not be doing sport after 40, then I'm gonna try and do something else. So I might try and maybe do uh, military high performance or business or something like that. So yeah, yeah, I I can, I I can I can agree with with the lifestyle and and certain things where if if in, in your businesses your lifestyle is fairly anti fragile. We we discussed that. Yeah. Um, you know, you have the multiple multiple sources of income, and that's that's held up well especially during times like this where, where guys like me start, start hurting a lot more because we're, we're a one trick 
one trick pony, right? Um, you know, if, if people aren't coming through the doors, we're hurting. So what the hell else are we doing? We're scrambling to start other things. So, coaching mentorship. We discuss this. I, <laughs> Watch this space. I, I, I told you, Brooker, like that's, that's what he wants us to do. The frigging coaching mentorship. Um, but it's to me for, for a guy like you. Yeah. Um, to necessarily coach at a higher level, just to prove that you have the biggest dick in the room. Like, Hey, I fucking said I could do it. And I'm doing it right. Like, yeah, ego. Absolutely. I fucking get it. Look for the goal, attain the goal. And here we go. Time to, time to fucking conquer the next mountain. Yeah. Um, but if your strength coach network continues to generate revenue, mm -hmm. if, if you continue to grow at the rate that you're growing, I mean, you know, you started off as some intern going to an asshole's uh, what's it called a, a seminar in Manchester, England. You know what I mean? Like, what, what was that? It was tremendous. We had a great weekend. <laughs> right? You started off as like some, some London Wasps intern mm -hmm. coming to one of my seminars. And now you're generating X amount of money with this, X amount of money with that. You're doing this and that and that. Why the fuck even leave the cushy position of being the king of the mountain in the small area and continue to grow all these other things? And then you could put your foot down and say, hey, I make enough money. I don't need to fucking be here. You need me more than I need you. And this allows me to coach the people that I want. Why not stay the fuck where you are and live the life you want to live? Be the big well, fish in the small just, pond in that avenue. I, well, I don't want to be a big fish in a small pond. I want to be a big fish in a big pond. I am probably addicted to biting off way more than I can chew professionally. Aren't we all? Yeah. And sometimes it's worked out. Sometimes it's not worked out, but I have to have like that, like anxiety, feel like I'm going to shit myself when I make a career decision. Um, there's that. And then the annoying thing about business to an extent in, well, if you have an online business as a coach, the credibility to be an authority, to charge people money about this is how you coach requires you to coach. Yeah. So the stuff that gives you the credibility directly competes with the time that you have available to grow the business that relies on you having the credibility. So at some point you have to decide, this is the a big problem I have with a lot of people is, you know, come and do my elite mentorship. It's like you haven't coached anyone in 10 years. Or they'll, they'll, gild the lily about their level of experience or their level of skin in the game that they have. So that's a challenge. And, um, you know, there's, there's a real, I actually think what you do and what I do are two very different things because they're effectively, you know, one, one is preparation and one is readiness with, with a little bit of exception for the, the NFL guys, but it's like you are training people for a result that they're going to realize potentially years down the line. Whereas we get six weeks, go, okay, get ready. And then you're going week to week to week. So they're, they're almost like two different disciplines. And if you enjoy that environment, you're not going to do that in the private sector. You, you rely on a gatekeeper saying, yes, come and train my athletes, please. So that's, that's one thing about if you enjoy that, you're going to have to work for somebody else. And right now I'm content to do that. But it's a very good question. So, so what is going to continue you to stay motivated once you achieve your goal? That's a very good question. <laughs> Truthfully, probably, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. Because what, what happens is, in my experience, again, is, is a strength and a weakness. I will celebrate a success for about five minutes and then be like, right, what's next? You yeah. and me both. Yeah. That's why you're driven. Yeah. I mean, it. When we met, you know, we met in 2011, I think it was. And, you know, I think when I was an intern, I was like, if I could have any kind of paid job whatsoever in professional rugby, I would be over the moon. Yeah. And I got it. And I was like, oh, I'm just fucking it. I'm just the academy guy. Or, you know, I'm, I'm making less than the poverty line. It's like, right, I need a, a senior job. 
So I get the senior job. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't get the senior job, but they more than doubled my salary overnight, which was still terrible. So the money issues that had been there had kind of like melted away a little bit. But then I was like, I'm still the academy guy. It's not good enough. So I threw my toys out of the pram and took a pay cut to go to Rotherham. And then I was there for a short while, but another, another team that I had been on staff with, with the head coach, that's why he recruited me. Final game of the season, we play them. They were expected to win. We put a bonus point win on them. And I had like number eights, like running away from their wingers, gassing them. So I'm like doing this. And then at the end of it, I got to uh, Australia and I'm like, I have no job. I was defining myself through my job. And then I had no job. I was like becoming a personal trainer. Then I get this carrot dangled in front of me, the Argentina gig, which required me to quit my day job for potentially a week to come back to live in one of the most expensive cities in the world with no money coming in. But I still took it because, you know, it's like I have to achieve this goal. But then it was, well, I'm just a replacement. And then I come back and I get the Sydney Roosters job which on the face of it, richest rugby league club in the world, world club champions, training the world player of the year. I had the title, but in reality, my duties went from this to this, to this, to this, to this, for a variety of other reasons. So then I'm complaining about, well, I've got everything else, but now I've not got the purpose. So then I left and I went to Argentina and then the personal life went down the pan. So then I'm complaining about that. So it's very, very tough to always be striving towards that next goal. I, th I think, is it the phrase you have to be, is it content, but not, oh no, happy, but not content. Mm. You, you know, I think as someone said, it's like, basically, if the journey doesn't make you happy, the destination never will. So it's one of those things that with maturity, <laughs> slowly getting there, you know, I'm not there by any means, but it's, you're learning to be happy with what you have but at the same time, not lose that hunger to try and get to the destination. So would I very much like to achieve all those things? Yes, I would. If you told me tomorrow, I can't coach another day in my life, I'd be okay with it. And I'd find the next thing to do. That may, that's what's made you achieve everything you, that you've, you've done, man. I mean, it's, you know, it's a, like you said, it's a blessing and a curse. And I mean, I always remember that, that Naval quote, and I know loads of people say it now, but like a desire is a contract to be unhappy until you get it, right? And I mean, yeah, that's just part of it. And I mean, I actually really enjoy hearing you talk about this sort of, this ego, because it's just, you've justified the ego. You know, as far as you're aware in your first player game in this reality, you are the fucking best because you went from, dude, I remember when I come and visited you at London Wasps, it was on an evening, it was fucking cold as fuck and guys would come to train him with their boots in a Tesco's carrier bag yep. and you were playing touch with them to warm up right yep. and then we went into the gym and they, you know like you've done you've done amazing over this course you know it's not even been 10 years or just right 10 years in August right so it's 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 been fantastic to look back mm -hmm. but at the same time you can't be looking back for too long because you need to keep fucking hammering away right so it's it is what it is, bro. It yeah. is what it is, you know? Yeah. And it's going to be interesting where the next 10 years take you. And, you know, let's see if it is out of pro, pro sport. So, but I like what Mike said as well about, you know, you being, I think your reputation has been nice for people that have been following you because I know you are very active on social media. And I know a lot of people that know you and they love the fact that they've seen you go through this transition and this transition and you've had the balls to actually now go to the U.S., and you got the balls to start saying things about you want to go to the NFL. So, you know, you never know. The biggest difference, or the thing that I love most about America, well, I'll say this, like, I've worked in a bunch of different countries. And I think that, you know, personally, you are going to find yourself to be most productive where there's that fit between you and the culture of a country. Mm. So in Japan, they value age, I won't say experience, I'll say longevity. Going with the company line and following a set of rules, which is great if you're making TVs, cars, mobile phones, and so on. Now, in an environment like sport, where somebody is required to gamble, put it on the line, stand up, follow me, we're going to do this, 
that does not fit with the culture. So if you look at the transformation of Japanese national rugby, who are the most prominent players? Foreigners that have been given Foreigners passports yeah. or mixed heritage players. So, you know, all those qualities I just described, is that me? No. They say the nail that sticks up gets hammered. I'm trying to be the nail. I've spent 10 years trying to be the nail. So there wasn't that fit. Whereas America, the national character of America a little bit, is if you come over here, you say, I want to go to the NFL. Everyone around you be like, fuck yeah. Whereas in England, you might have experienced it. I say, pay your dues, do your time. Ah, fuck off. I don't want to do my time. I want to do it now. And if I'm going to fail, I'll fail. You know, nobody told Mark Zuckerberg when he was 19 years old to do his dues. They said, here's half a million dollars. Go make me rich. And that's what I, I love about America. It's, there, there's stuff very, very wrong with America. If you are towards the bottom rung of society, it's a very, very hard place to be. But more than any other place in the world, it also gives you access to be at the top. Yeah. And that's the American dream. Yeah. That's what everyone talks about. You've got, you got a shot. You know, and I think America is one of the, the, the places that I've experienced and I've been to a bunch of different places and I've seen that in the US you can come from anywhere and be anyone and people kind of let you just go. You know what I mean? Like there's less of a sort of, it's like the crabs in the bucket, you know, everywhere else. They, the they seem to you, right? you, down. you know, they talk about the 1% in America. 70% mm. of people in America at some point within their lives will join the 1%. Doesn't mean they're going to stay there but they'll get a flavor for it. So actually, America is one of the most socially mobile countries on earth. They're just gonna drag you back down again because there's no safety net. Whereas if you look at, I think it's France, is one of the least socially mobile societies, especially in Europe. If you've got money, you're gonna have money, you're gonna stay there. If you don't have money, it, it's not gonna suck quite as bad at the bottom, but you're probably gonna stay there. Yeah. Say that stat again. 71% of Americans at some point within their life will join the 1% of annual earnings. Shut the That's fuck That's amazing. Up. That just, it sounds like that but can't be true. They might not stay there. Yeah. That yeah. is incredible. Yeah. So I was just talking to one of my buddies and we're, you know, we're discussing a certain shelf life that, that he has in his career and that most people have in their careers. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, you have peak earnings, right? Your peak earnings state. And with me, I mean, the way I look at my life is every day that I'm alive and I'm learning, I become more valuable. But yep. if you're a financial advisor or you're working on Wall Street doing something or a stock trader or this or that or whatever, it doesn't correlate to that. Like my dad, my dad was a CFO of a publishing company mm -hmm. that got sold. And my dad was like 65 when the publishing company got sold. And what they do, they brought a new, a new CEO and who's the first person to get replaced? The CFO. And what happened to my dad? Yeah. 65, no job, had to start back at the bottom with another company. And he said, and, and you know, like a, a lower level company he had to be the CFO of for because he couldn't, he couldn't just go into another spot because he was too fucking old. His mm -hmm. peak earning potential capped out right there when he was 65. It was tough for him to get another fucking job again. That's why he was adamant about me, make your own future. Of have course. your own fucking job yeah and you know i've had people argue with me on social media but it's true to me it's true profit is the difference between what you get paid and what you're worth okay because if the work that you do makes me 100 bucks and i pay you 100 bucks what's left for me so that that is what it is if you want the security of knowing that no matter what, with very few exceptions, you're going to get paid at the end of the month. When you clock out at 5 p.m., you're not going to have to worry about, you know, a, a disaster or picking up email and the phone. The, the, the difference between what gets generated and what you get paid is the premium that you paid to enjoy that privilege. And as the business owner, the price that you pay to take that chunk is it all falls on you. And going back to Naval, I, I tell it to guys in football, if you think hard work is the answer to your problems, go work in a sweatshop for a year and tell me if it makes you a millionaire. Yeah. Okay. Hard work is baked in because 
if your plan is as good as my plan and you work harder, you're going to, you're going to win. Problem is there's only so many hours in a day that you can work. There's only so much effort that you can put forth, which is sustainable. So ultimately the deciding factor is going to be the quality of the plan, which is not normally distributed. So I just get into my head of like reading like Talib and stuff. You should be looking for non normally distributed systems with which to invest your time and effort. If Gordango trains way, way harder than me, let's say he's the most muscular individual on earth. He's Phil Heath, who I bumped into in San Antonio this year. Um, he's going to be twice as muscular as me, twice, twice the median. Okay. That's a normally distributed system. If Bill Gates walks into a cafe, everybody on average becomes a millionaire or a billionaire. Yep. That is a non normally distributed system. The richest individual can be, 10 million times richer than the median individual. So if you're looking for systems which aren't capped, you have to be investing your time and effort into non-normally distributed systems. One thing of which is a scalable business as opposed to a salary job. If you're trading hours for dollars, you've come into that trap. So it's not to say that you should never do that, but you should be seeking some kind of additional incentive on top of that, which is not capped. Yeah. Because you speak to a personal trainer and say, Oh, I own my own business. Well, if you don't coach people, you don't get any money. That's not a business. That's a job that you own. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a cap to that, which is how much are people willing to pay for a session of personal training, which is flexible, but it's capped. There's how many hours can you do a day and there's how many days can you work in a week? And guess what? The productivity goes down the more that you do. Whereas I own a gym and I hire you to train people for me with my proprietary model. That's not capped. I can just hire more people. I can rent more space and so on. Yep. Yep. Tough yeah. to do. It is tough to do. And the thing is, is that when you go from working a normal job and say you don't come from a background with, where you get installed this, I like to call it like boss mentality. You know, if you don't, if you don't grow up and you don't see other, I mean, I'm talking just from the male perspective, you don't see other men that are sort of teaching you this kind of, kind of stuff from a young age, you go from a job and then you think, right, I'm going to have my own business. And I'm just going to do what I do. But I'm going to be in charge of it. That's yeah. great. But until you have something that goes wrong or you know what I mean? Or you need to be yeah. somewhere else or, and then you start realizing I'm getting more fucked here. The fact that I even own this thing and I've got no other streams that are working off of this. And it's, it's, it, you go from, I think you're even more fragile. You know, it's like that rich dad, poor dad quadrant, right? You know, mm -hmm. and you have to move over yeah. at some point. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're just waiting to get fucked at some point. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's tough to do. And the thing that's very, very difficult about, training is it's inherently non-scalable because if you if you look at something like a trading algorithm or software as a service it's push a button and it scales if it's good enough and it's proprietary because we've worked on the code it's written up under law you can't steal this or that all this kind of stuff and we put the money in to develop it is anything that us three as coaches do proprietary. Absolutely no. not. No. We're just rearranging the pieces to try and eke out a little bit of a difference. Is it scalable? No, because it requires, you know, they say the art of coaching. Absolutely. There's an art of coaching because there's all these different factors that affect one another. And it's a dynamic system in a dynamic system. All variables affect one another in unpredictable ways. So it cannot be predictive, uh, predicted and it cannot be scaled. And, really wants to stop your employee walking out, setting up shop across the street and tweaking a bit and say, oh, this is our proprietary way of training. It would be a lie, but it's inherently non-scalable. So the challenge, look at, look at the prominent businesses within high performance. Do Exos make money training athletes? No. What do they make money on? No. Education. Right, education, seminars. Education, corporate, and they used to make money off military scalable yeah because all their lo all their locations are in gorgeous places there's no way there's no way those there's no way those locations make money 
It's a marketing exercise. Look at how many first round picks we got signed up for this education. That's yeah. scale. Because guess what? It doesn't take me any more effort to put two more chairs in the room. It takes me a lot more effort to train more athletes. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and um, health insurance. They have like some corporate wellness thing. And therein lies the rub with me. <laughs> That's, and that there, Kier, is exactly why I am, I'm, I'm, I'm significantly more knowledgeable. Uh, and yeah. I'm, making, I'm making probably, I don't know, triple, quadruple the money, maybe more. I don't know. Yeah, definitely, probably more than that than when you saw me in 2010. Yeah. But well, I'm, still, I'm still just me. No, Where, I mean, if, if you want to do that, that's great because it's that Malcolm Gladwell thing. If I offered you a hundred grand a year to be a toll booth collector or 50 grand a year to be an architect, which one are you going to pick? You have to enjoy what you do, but it's like this Warren Buffett thing of you don't have to make it back the way that you lost it. So if you lose money on a stock, you don't have to double down on that stock or that asset class or anything. So you can say, all right, you want to train athletes all day long. No one is handcuffing you and saying you must make money from strength and conditioning you can put your money into any other thing that is yeah. scalable repeatable and you say you know what i really like to train athletes and you can continue to make that money and then you just put it across put it across put it across yeah yeah jim jim wendler told an awesome story about this like swedish metal band and uh have you heard it do you, do you know what i'm talking about okay so he said they these they, they were i forget the name of the band but they they only had like 10,000 10, fans 10,000 sales in in one of their last albums but they had a deal with the record company but they were both there were two or three people in it and they were career mailmen they had like federal jobs so yeah. that's what paid the bills and then they literally were musicians because they fucking loved being musicians so the record company said hey you got to release this release this album right now they're like no it's not ready so we'll release it in march march came march went no, it's not fucking ready. So the record said, record company said, you're in violation of your contract. We're dropping you. They said, all right, fuck it. I don't give a shit. We got jobs. We don't need this money. Go fuck yourselves. And we're going to release the album when it's ready. They released it two years later and their fan, fan base went up 10x because it, they went out when they were ready. They were doing things on their terms rather than doing things because they had to, right? Like I'm not doing strength and conditioning necessarily because... It's my, it, yeah, it's my main moneymaker, but I don't make any decisions essentially because of money. I've had opportunities to make more money doing mm -hmm. what I'm doing and it wasn't the right fit for me. So I said, fuck it. And I think by consistently, <coughs> I don't know, living, living like that and consistently not making the decisions totally based on money, but based on what it is that I want to do, the product is going to become more valuable. But Again, I'm still trading hours for dollars doing what I, I, I'm just a fucking union worker. You know what I mean? Like essentially that's a, Hey, I, I got this fucking hourly wage and that's all I'm going to fucking do with it. And uh, how you doing? Have a good day. Money does not make you happy, but it buys you freedom and freedom makes you happy. Sure. Mm -hmm. So you, I think you have to have the freedom built into what you do that if you don't like it, you, you are free to walk away. You happen to love what you do, so you don't necessarily need it. Yeah, yeah, and you find a lot of fulfillment, man. Like when I hear you, the happiest is usually when you've figured something out. It's like, oh, I had this guy come in and he had this, and oh, man, I can't believe it. I just did touch this part and did this, and look, he's now good. You know what I mean? So, and I think you go. I mean, I can talk for myself too. I feel like I go into you know modes of flow state through coaching. So that's also very, very valuable and fulfilling. But it's weird because I also, you know, and then it flips back because I know lawyers that earn, you know, serious money per hour, but it's still per hour. And that, you know, and I think some people, they can be sort of settled and content, like what you said, the difference between happiness and content. And some people can be content with, you know, I've got this hour block, Per week, I earn 20, 30, 40 a month and it's good and I'm good with that, you know? And there's other people that it's something in them and they just got to be honest and just say, listen, this is, I'm worried about this because- Rich people have problems. I, yeah. I guarantee you those pro athletes that you work with that have millions in the bank, 
they still have problems. You know, I've worked with all blacks, you know, not, not on the level of NFL, but they'll, they'll make your dad's salary in a, in a month for a year. They still got problems. They still got stuff they moan about. They still have worries. So I, I you know, if I think I've read about the research, but basically if you're poor, are you more likely to be unhappy? Hell yeah. Cause you need to keep the lights on. You need to know that your kids are going to be healthy, that you can afford to feed them good food, that you can look after yourself, that you can prepare for things that might be unexpected. And the more you go up, the less you have to worry about that, you're going to be a little bit happier, but then there's going to be a threshold after which you keep increasing it. It's, uh, it's going to slow. And then eventually you just make more money. It's not going to make you happy. I think it's 70, $75,000, 70 or $75,000. After which it starts to slow. But I mm-hmm. remember there was, uh, in the UK, you know, Tetra pack. Yeah. Yeah. So when you, when you buy a carton of orange juice, that, uh, mode of pressing the cardboard to make the carton, that's Tetra pack. It's a Swedish invention the company. The, the family is worth billions. Google the air of Tetra pack and see what happened in Mayfair in London. This chick had everything wrong with her, you know, literally addicted to heroin, living a depraved life, living in this mansion, her, she, she overdosed and died. And her husband was so strung out on heroin that he left the body in this mansion for six weeks and kept doing drugs. And they, you know, the body was that decomposed. They, they put him on, I think they either arrested him or they put him on trial for her murder. And in the end, it was just like, actually, no, this guy is such a degenerate drug addict that he just left the body and carried on doing what he was going to do. Yeah. That those two people have more money than they know what to do with in 20 lifetimes and still deeply unhappy. Yes. And funnily enough, you know, my podcast, I'm doing an episode next Friday with a guy that used to be a heroin addict to talk about addiction and the parallels that might be there in sport. Yeah, that'd be interesting. I'm yeah. sure there's huge overlaps. I mean, I see that with all of the psychological consulting. So many of these guys, are, they elicit serious uh, addiction properties and, 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 and have huge issues, a lot of childhood trauma. And yeah. most of the time, that's what made them great because they, yeah. they recognize that when they did good, when they were young, they got more attention from their parents. Yeah. You know, so before you know it, it's like I have to do yeah. good for people to love me. And if, you know, if I do it's good, like, wow. everyone loves me. And if not, it's going down. Think about all the people that you can admire. So many of them have one or both parents missing from their background. So it appears to be a tremendous recipe for success. Unfortunately, 99 times out of 100, it also appears to be the the surest way to just pull the pin and destroy a a child's life. There's no middle ground. It's either going to drive you that way or it's going to drive you right down. But you look like Eminem, uh, Steve Jobs, Adopted, uh, any number of athletes don't know their fathers. It's, it's really interesting. Yeah, it is, man. And I've, you know, I know some extremely wealthy people, like beyond what you can earn in a job or, you know, yeah. old money. Yeah. Fucked up. Yeah. Really, really fucked up. And one of the, the, the most striking uh, quotes I ever heard was like, if you bring a child to the top of the mountain, you rob him the opportunity of climbing it. And yeah. there is something very, very important that goes on about, you know, climbing up to the top. This and a lot of the time, all the things that, yeah, a lot of the time, all the things we think are, if I just have that, then I'm good. I mean, it's never worked before. You've been saying that your whole fucking life and it yeah. never did. So rather than just, you know, when I heard Dan Bilzeri and say, you know, the journey to the top is better than being at the top, that made me fucking stop and think a second you know what i mean because that guy got everything that he would ever want he probably couldn't go broke if he tried right now because he's got it properly legally set up do you know what i mean so well this is there's a beauty in that you want the romanticism you don't want to know that it's guaranteed otherwise then it just gets boring like you want the drama uh, i watched uh it was a professor of philosophy give a lecture on meditations by marcus aurelius Mm. so you know why, why is that such a profound book? Because it's easy for, you know, have you ever seen that Bill Burr stand up about people saying that Tiger Woods is morally reprehensible? Guess what? You'd behave like Tiger Woods if you had that money and fame. <laughs> because it's easy, it's easy to say no to people when you're driving home and like your, uh, your Mercury, you know, secondhand Mercury. 
So why is meditation such a powerful book? Because at that time, if you were the emperor of Rome, you were by definition the most powerful person on earth. You can say what you want, do what you want, fuck who you want, anyone disagrees with you, you can have them killed. So you have all of the opportunity to do whatever you want with none of the consequence other than maybe getting assassinated by your guards eventually. But there's, you know, there's leeway there. So why is it that Marcus Aurelius chose to lead such a principled life and try and be a person that 2000 years later, people are holding up his diaries that he thought nobody would ever read and say, this is the blueprint to live. Mm -hmm. Because having the ability to do all those things doesn't make you happy. The purpose does and how people will speak about you when you're gone. Oh, mate, we get fucking heavy here, Jesus. <laughs> I'll tell this you is what... better than sets and sets and rep shit. Yeah. Like at the beginning, man, we don't want to be talking about none of this garbage. Yeah. I'll tell you what, though, you give me ten million dollars, none of you fuckers will ever hear from me again. Bro, I'm just chilling. Then you'll be fuck fucking out. miserable too. Yeah, 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 yeah. You kidding me? I'll be doing exactly what the fuck I'm doing for fucking free. And I will be a pig in shit. I the don't give a is, fuck. The goal is wealthy and anonymous, not poor and notorious. Yes. <laughs> did you did you ever see that meme? Some some grind to be noticed. I grind to disappear. And it was like a picture of a mansion versus a picture of like a fucking farm in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Oh, I don't I don't want to be heard from. I even the thought of doing this fucking podcast, it drives me crazy. I don't want to fucking I, I don't want to be out there like this. Are you kidding? I think the best way to do a podcast or to, to do a blog uh, is if nobody would consume it other than you. you. You have to do it for you. And, you know, fortunately, I've been in the position where nobody actually <laughs> read it or listened. But if, if you would do it and nobody would consume it other than you, it's worthwhile to do. Mm. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I mean, one of, one of my – one of my passions is, I mean, I fucking love Joe Rogan. Like, I love jo what Joe Rogan does. What does that motherfucker do? He sits there and- Whatever he, he wants. <laughs> well, whatever he wants, but he gets to chill with some of the most interesting and knowledgeable people on fucking earth, have a fucking glass of scotch with them, and just talk shit with them for three, yeah. four hours at a clip, and he gets paid to do it, right? Like, Here's the thing, right? Scalability. How much was the Joe Rogan podcast worth after one episode? Fucking nothing. Nothing. How what bad about, was the first podcast? Yeah. What about 100? Nothing. 200, 300, 400. He's at 1,500 now. What's it worth? 100 million bucks. That is exponential growth and scalability. That's the power of that stuff like that. And the power of ownership. Mm. What, what, you know, he... Got to say, they wrote into that agreement. You can say whatever you want. Just give us a licensing. That's powerful. That's why I think people aspire to have uh, a lifestyle like that. Now, not everyone's going to make 100 million bucks. And you, you might even have to take a little hit of what somebody will pay you. But knowing that you can't be fired, you can say what you want, think what you want, do what you want. And again, Naval, you know, it's freedom to say no and the freedom from having to do certain things yeah it's not about acquisition it's about freedom mm -hmm. yeah that's that's and and my personally with me my my only shackles essentially are my anxiety right the only thing that stops my freedom is my anxiety and my anxiety is brought on by a couple of things one is my fucking diet <laughs> which did you guys did you guys happen to see my instagram today and what i ate already was it keeping Pete's? No, not yet. That's later. I already had, I had like twelve or thirteen hundred calories in pancakes, bacon, uh, and uh, sausage with a whole fuck ton of syrup. And then I had a, a whole. I think I had a whole tray of cinnamon buns, which was like fifteen hundred calories. And oh, that yeah. Was, oh yeah, bro, it was great. Solid. That's the, the problem of uh, poor countries is scarcity. The problem of rich countries is abundance. There's that. Well, this is not abundance just yet. It, later on, right now I'm at my I'm at my mac, my my caloric rate. Now <laughs> yeah. it'll be abundance after that. Yeah. But then the other thing, the other thing that brings up my anxiety is is money, right? So if I don't have X amount of money saved, like right now, I could not work 
for five, six years and be perfectly fine. Yeah. And live, live the exact same lifestyle I'm living and be perfectly fine. Probably longer than that, right? But it's, it's an illusion. It's an illusion that you, you tell yourself. Yeah. You know, Seneca, is this the condition that I fit? Bro, one of the most liberating things that ever happened to me was quitting the dream job and having no income stream. Because I quit and people were sending me messages on Twitter like, oh my God, what have you done? And you go like this, like, I'm still alive. I'm still alive. What would, what would you do tomorrow if you lost it all? Just fucking go out and make it back. No. <laughs> Bro, exactly. if you have life, limb, and liberty, to quote my head coach, you are in the game. Yep. There's no, the anxiety is in your head. I know, I, you know, you know that it's in your head, but yep. that's it. What you're sitting in is way, worth way more than anything you'd ever earn. Like how much for your leg? Yeah. But you know, they say, I don't know. I could give you a price yeah, for my leg. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> then we keep moving up, bro. What about them? <laughs> what about them bollocks? How much for them? Huh? That's got to be worth a couple more. You can probably answer that question based on the uh, Chinese black market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But depression, excess focus on the past, anxiety, excess focus on the future. That's why in Buddhism, they always talk about like present, be present. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Yeah. But that's also why that, that nice quote about enjoying the ride, you know, like looking to go somewhere, but no, like when you get there, it don't mean shit unless you actually enjoy it all the turbulence going because it's going to die anyway <laughs> exactly and exactly 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 yeah. and also the best moments in your life that you've ever had and the worst moments in your life you've ever had they didn't really mean anything because they come they rose they peaked they passed away yeah and let's just say you know i've had experiences in my life where i've had sudden epiphanies that i literally told myself like oh me is just a story that i tell myself yeah it's, it's a, when you think about it, it's a really hard question to answer. Like, what kind of a person am I if you don't define yourself through what you do mm -hmm. or what you have or that kind of stuff? It's a really, really hard question to answer. And sometimes losing that stuff and just getting rid of it, it can be uh, eliminating. Yeah. You know, with, with this whole COVID thing and people not being able to do what they do for a living. Now I I've, I've been fortunate I've been able to continue to, you know, per, do one-on-ones and stuff like that with with guys like whether it's at their house or whatever. Um if 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 you were to take away and it made me think, right? You take away what you do for a living and and you know, that's that's how I define myself. I mean, people ask like, "Oh, you know, Gurango, what, you know, he's he's a personal trainer or he's like, you know, that weird looking the box jump guy. That by the box jump guy. Not for not for a while I haven't been. But if you were to take away what I'm doing right now, like this is this is what fuels me. And for a while, uh, prior to going back to school, um, I mean, I was taking up the piano. I was going to start surfing. I was doing some other things to start fulfilling myself because what I was doing was becoming monotonous and easy to me. And, and therefore, it started becoming slightly boring. Mm -hmm. um, but now adding in the, the acupuncture aspect, it added in a whole other realm that excited me and it made me, it reinvigorated me. But if, if you took away my ability to work on the human body or, or my ability, I, I, I think it's the problem solving. If you said, hey, Mike, you could no longer problem solve. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't see it worth living. Yeah. You know, like, for, so for me, this is who I am, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and, and I've, I've thought about this multiple nights by the fire, just sitting there, just, just thinking like, well, if I could no longer do this, what would I do? This is, to me, what am I going to do? Just, just fucking go, go down to South America for 18 months, riding on the bike and just fucking be, I, I, I can't. Doing the Brooker. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like I could never envision seeing myself just being like that. Right. Without it. it Cause then it's just, I'm purposeless in my eyes, but that again, I've never been just yeah, chilling. You never, you never tried it. It's you know, uh, you never tried it. Who is it? Who's, he wrote that quote about basically, is it like insanity is trying to sit alone quietly in a, in a, an empty room. <laughs> I don't know. It's, I never heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is. You know, I've, I've spoken to people that have done like uh, meditation retreats for 
six days where you're not allowed you sit and meditate for 14 hours a day you're not allowed to speak to anyone yeah, that's oh, vipassana they do usually yes, 10 it was days. yeah and yeah. brooker did it for 13 yeah. yeah was it one of the hardest things you've ever had to do sure i've heard that all right so sure. i think you know i'm actually i was scared to do it i didn't want to do it but it's like yeah i think one of the things that you know i've talked about to to my assistant scott is are, are we using, oh, oh, is this the highest use of our time and abilities? What's the highest use? What's the most important thing that you can do? And, you know, that's going to change as you develop as a person, you go through your career as well. But I think if the, the purpose and the satisfaction of life comes from what is the highest use? What's, what purpose are you serving? Mm -hmm. And for you, the answer is going to be obviously helping people to to build careers and build lives for themselves through sport and that may change but as long as you fulfill that purpose that's the most important thing yeah if, if i offered you the same amount of money or if i offered you double the amount of money to go stack shelves at walmart you tell me to fuck off well no, well that 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 depends on what year you're telling me it'd make double the money <laughs> And how long I'd have to do it for. Because then, shit, if I do that for five years, I pay my dues. I don't give a fuck. I'll retire and still go back to doing what I'm doing. The fact that you ask those questions tells you it's not for you. Oh, ab absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. Bro, this is getting heavy. It's, it's been heavy. This is the real shit. Did you, did you speak about this stuff to DMAC? <laughs> Oh yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, McCordy, McCordy. We talked. I mean, that that motherfucker's upbringing. It was. I mean, he's he he's something else. I mean, yeah. what, the 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 shit that he's had to overcome in his life. But I mean, that's so. Brooker and I were talking about it with this podcast and and what we want to bring to it. Right. It's not about. I mean, yeah, we could do this. We could do the sets and reps thing, right? Like if that's what someone has to talk about, like to to Brooker and I, it doesn't fucking matter. Cause yeah. it's, it, you know, it's like kind of boring. You do in one set, you know, in one sense you'll do like, Hey, let's, let's do sets of 20 until the wheels fall off. And mm -hmm. to me, I'll do, you know, 40 on 20 off until the wheels fall off sort of thing. And then, Hey, we'll, we'll move on to something else. It, it doesn't matter. Yeah, right? yeah. Like everyone's got their own different way to do things. But I mean, the way we look at it is whatever's going to resonate with that person, what they needed to hear with that episode for that day and was going to get them better. Fuck. That's what we're going to do. So we don't give a shit. Yeah. You know, so whatever, whatever people want to talk about, man, and this is with you and what I know about you, I mean, this is the perfect fucking shit for us to talk about because you're an extremely motivated dude. You're a fucking super smart dude. You came from nothing, built yourself fucking up to something, and now you can't wait to fucking do that again. I'm trying. Let's That's talk about you having a baby, Brooker. Are you ready for that? I don't think you're ever ready, are you? It's heavy. I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. Like... I will say, you know, we haven't said this on air. I was wearing this shirt, this free Melania Trump shirt, <laughs> when I held my baby for the first time. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and what's that like? Bro, you see him come out. It's honestly, it's, you feel like that hormonal dump. You're just like, somebody presses a button, your body just goes, like that, and you think, fucking hell. <laughs> and it's so weird. I saw my baby came out. Well, I come out and I was just like, I've always thought this, but he came out and I was like, that's it. There is no God. And it didn't matter. It didn't matter to me. It was very, very heavy. But I tell you what, mate, it's, it's very, uh, it's kind of like the matrix. You have to experience it. You can't be told what it's like. Mm. Once you, I'm very excited for you, but yes, man. yeah, when you, when you get to experience it, it's, it's more of a paradigm shift. Is the only time in my life I've looked forward to getting older. Because when you're, yeah, when you're younger, when you don't have a kid, you see that like hourglass empty and you're like, fuck, I'm running out of time, I'm running out of time, I'm running out of time, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I've got to do this. Whereas now I'm excited to be 10 years older because I get to see what he's going to be like in 10 years. Mm, it's heavy. Sure. Yeah. Sure. You're going to enjoy it. Sure. It's just this evolution of, of, uh, of yourself right like i mean from when when i was sort of just like a pirate mm -hmm. you know with nothing and i didn't care where i was i didn't care what was going on it yeah. was all cool i just fully believed that wherever i was was exactly where i needed to be and just kept going like that 
And, you know, I feel like I experienced real complete freedom. Like so much so that I remember just like screaming aloud, right? And, you know, just, it was euphoric, right? Yeah. And then my idea was always, can you transition that back into sort of, you know, the real world? Mm -hmm. But then you start realizing what the fuck is the real world anyway? Because if you go to enough places, what is normal? That just doesn't exist either. Yeah. So then trying to sort of maintain that sense of freedom that, you know, if I want to tomorrow, I could drop it all. And that's, I can always go back there. Yeah. yeah. Because what read, is um, it? Principles by Ray Dalio. Yeah. I've, I've not read the book, but I know more or less some of the concepts of it. Yeah. He, in, in the book, he talks about there are three phases in life. The first is where you're reliant on others. The second mm. is where others are reliant on you. And the third is where you get for free. So it's your job to give back to others. Yeah. So, you know, I was talking to my dad in the car. He happened to be in the States. He timed it well that when the baby was born, the baby was a week old and I was in the car with my dad going to traffic court, actually. And what we were talking about that and it hit me. I was like, fuck, phase one's over. I'm in phase two. <laughs> yep. And, you know, that's, you know, hopefully every, every parent is like, once you get pushed into that, it's like whether you like it or not, phase two. Yeah, and, and he's, the and challenges associated with that are different. The mentality is going to be different. It's it's very interesting. Sure, and I can really feel myself transitioning. Like, say, like if I didn't know I was going to become a dad, and the whole Corona stuff was going on, I'd have been like, "Fucking yes, here yeah. we go. Let it all burn down. This is going to be fucking awesome." Just to watch yeah. chaos go on. And that was the first thing that came into my head. And then it was like, "Hang on a second, you got something coming in here," and. Mm -hmm. You know, do you know what I mean? So I'm already like transitioning into this. My sense of uh, urgency is through the roof. Yep. And all I'm thinking about is how do I get myself set up? Because I just want to spend as much time as possible. Because yeah. I mean, man, I, you know, and it sounds like dramatic, but like when you see people just like die, like I remember when I was in Brazil once, I saw this guy get gobbled up by a truck on a motorbike. He was yeah. in front of me. Truck just moved, boom, gone. straight away gone, instantly. And then you're like, that can happen anytime, any place, any person. I mean, by the time I was 18, I had two guys in my rugby team, both get cancer and both die. I mean, they didn't die within that year, but they died real quick. So yeah. this fragility of life, that's just like, I need to organize my own, uh, my own development in my creation and what I'm interested in push that and leverage that but build it at the same time so that i can spend time with my little girl that's, gonna See, that's the old uh plant trees in which shade you'll never sit yeah that's that's like i think the whole like parenting thing is like if if you had to you think fuck i've cut my arm off for this little <laughs> little dickhead <laughs> yeah yeah and i'm thinking it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean no. that it's annoying, but no. yeah. and I'm, I'm 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 honestly i'm at the point right now where i feel like everything that I've learned to this point was just to be able to pass that knowledge on to the next person. Mm -hmm. And all I want to do is spend time with that person, but I want to do it in a very unique and condensed way. So like I'm really debating in about five years, sell everything up, buy a boat and sail around the world Yeah, and, and, and spend these, these, this time together. Cause I mean, at some point the kid's going to be old and don't want to be around you no more. You know what I mean? So well, here's the thing as well. On paper, you know, academics, you've fucked that kid. But you know what? I would do exactly the same because what does is, what is school teach you to do? Check a box. Check a box. Do as you're told. Get a job. You know, I, I, just as a quick aside, our parents' generation was the last generation where if you did as you were told and you got a piece of paper and you kept your head down, you, you wouldn't have to worry until you retired. Mm. Bullshit. It does not exist anymore. You are, your job is to be creative and take risks and put yourself out there. Yes. And you get that from specializing in what it is that you'd love to do and you have enthusiasm for. Yeah. Not that you're okay at 12 different things. Yeah. It's better to be a moron at math and English and say, you know what? I am going to be an awesome scientist or a coder or something like that. And that's what, you know, I have many, 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 many problems with my son's mother, but she decided at the age of 11, I'm going to be a professional ballerina. 
and she left school at 16 and she became a professional ballerina for the New York Met because, you know, it didn't, didn't matter all this, like other subjects and stuff like that. She wanted to do it. She did it. And that like for my kid, I'm just going to say, right, whatever it is you want to do, don't listen to me. Don't listen to school. Go out and reverse engineer it and make it happen. And then obviously you're going to try and help them to do that. So oh, I, yeah. I would trade my schooling to go around the world on a boat in a sure. heartbeat. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And I think what, you know, what is, at least you hope the kid just wants to spend time with you. And the yeah. more that you spend time there, you, I want to know who she is. And you know what I mean? Like that's, that's got to be the most valuable thing for me. So I think it's also in the, like the, in the, 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 the Tao Te Ching. It's like, if you know something fully, you know everything about other things or something along those lines. So if you pursue one thing, you're learning about everything else in the pursuit of, of one, of one uh, topic. Do you, does that ring a bell or something? I oh, know I've garbled the, the no, quote. No, just, you know, just bringing it back to, to coaching. One thing that you pick up this name, I'm going to drop. Darcy Norman said to me, uh, after, you know, they won the World Cup with Germany. And Exos said, who do you want to learn from for the World Cup next year in rugby? I said, give me a day with Darcy Norman. And to be fair to them, they did it. They flew him in and we got to sit in a room with him for a day. And one of the things that he talked about is, by definition, when you begin, you're, a, you're a, a generalist. You're okay at a bunch of stuff. You're not an expert at anything. And then naturally, you're going to gravitate towards being the guy in one thing. You've got an area that you're really good at that you like. So does Mike. I have the same. But eventually, when you become the guy running the business, managing the staff, being the head, you have to become a generalist again. Yeah. So it's like, you know, for, for my kid, I want my kid to just – be okay at a bunch of stuff and say, right, what is it that you want to do that you want to be the world's best at and then go out and do it. Yeah. And then if you get bored and you change your mind, you want to be a generalist again, go do that. What is sport? So what does education teach you to do? Teaches you to be okay at a bunch of stuff and not focus on one thing. Yeah. Vertical integration and training. Do the bare minimum of a bunch of shit. Do that one thing that you really need to focus on and hammer the fuck out of it. Yeah. Education, same. Be okay at this, right. What do you like to do? Go do 50% of it in the working week. Yep. That's how I do it differently. I'm not an educator. So, so to combat those ideas, um, there's, there's also the thought process of becoming specialized with one thing and you become very, very good at it, right? That's only one analogy you're creating. And then you become the man with the hammer syndrome. Whereas my thought process with what it is that I'm trying to do with my education for myself is become become very, very good at multiple avenues within some kind of realm, right? Yeah. That all kind of constitute the realm, but kind of don't. And they're always on outside edges of it. And then all of a sudden you become a super expert in multiple things. more than You're in that third phase. That's why. Mm. Yeah. You've been doing yeah, it. And it's, it's called skill stacking. I mean, Scott yeah. Adams talks about this and this is it's fantastic. That's how you separate yourself from already a, a niche field and you make yourself even more unique, you know, and, and, and authentically you because you've pursued your, your intuitions. Yeah. So yeah. And I mean, it also, it's all the same. You're trying to make people feel better. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But I mean, even, even if I were to have it my way with my kid, right. They would be very good at sports. And I shouldn't even say very good, but they'd be very competent. They'd be competent in sports. They'd be competent in music. They'd be competent at arts. They'd be competent. You name it. I want them to be competent and not, and not just like, hey, we have art class. I want them to, to dedicate a lot of time, sufficient time doing this and learning about that and what constitutes these subject matter in these areas. That way you can fully understand it. And now when you're trying to apply, or when you're trying to problem solve throughout life, you can pull from all these different branches to be able to come up with a solution rather than just saying, well, you know, I'm really good at working with fucking batteries. How does a battery work? Let me apply that to this. Like, that's cool. That's great. But also it doesn't like the, the well-rounded Jack of all trades uh, is a very, very valuable person when it comes to specialization. Whereas if you specialize very, very early, then Without you're limited. That What's that? Without that foundation. Exactly. But at the same time, you don't want to be the CrossFit of child development. 
good at a bunch of stuff, excellent at nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like that's not the, the inherent human condition. I, I think we have, all of us have skills and there's this huge focus on, oh, I need to focus on my weaknesses. And I think that's, comp I don't think you should focus on your weakness. I think you should focus on your skills because you have no idea where, and especially if you go in this realm of, I'm just going to pursue this myself and use my own intuition to develop this rather than look at this guy, this guy's five-step plan is going to get me to this, you know, like drop all of that garbage and try to become a complete world expert and leader in one thing at, whilst, you know, exploring other stuff. And maybe you have to look at your weaknesses a bit, but if you're born with inherent strengths, you're always going to be better at art or music or dance or sport. Exactly. And yeah. It, just it comes, throw them at it, it all. It from passion and a position of strength. Yeah. Success yeah. comes from exploiting your own strengths. What yeah. is the, the trick is to not have such a glaring weakness. Yes, absolutely. And one of the, the last thing I wanted to say here is, I'm going to really make sure that I don't live through my kid. Keep doing my own thing. And I want her to see me happy, excited, motivated for things so that she sees that that as, a, as an example. And then that also gives me a lot more patience because I never want to be the parents like, you have to do this. And why are you not doing it? Why are you not getting better? You know what I mean? Just because it's repressed, repressed uh, a state inside myself of not pursuing anything. You know what I mean? Living, so, living vicariously through your kids. Yeah, that I've seen so many crazy parents, man. I hey, it keeps, it keeps the strength and conditioning field uh, profitable, though. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So, so to again, to combat another thought. Yeah, I see. I mean, I train a lot of kids, tons of kids. Uh, pro, I, what, what do I? What do I end up having? Five, seven thousand training sessions uh, a year, something yeah. outrageous like that. Um. And probably it may, maybe more in some instances, right? So I see kids a lot. I see a lot of personalities and I see certain personalities with certain parents and the kids that succeed, the kids that don't, and the kids that do better than they should and don't do as well as they should. And all kids kind of come to a point where they're, 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 at, they're at that crossroads where they're like, well, I kind of want to play. I kind of don't want to play. And if you're a parent that says, ah, well, do what you want to do, sometimes a kid does it, sometimes a kid doesn't. But if you're that parent that says, what the fuck are you doing? Quit wasting your fucking time, get your fucking ass in gear, and fucking go and do what you're supposed to do. Those kids end up doing pretty well. And they end up excelling because they do, direction is needed. Like these kids, they, they need guidance. They don't know what the fuck they're doing. If it was up to every kid. Don't get me wrong. Like, once my kid picks, I'm, I'm putting the pressure on. Yeah, yeah. sure. That's, that's, that's the pick. support and guidance. You can pick. But you yeah. know what? It's like, right, you picked. Here we go. But yeah. it, I mean, if you leave it up to these fucking little shit-throwing monkeys, I mean, they'll, they'll be having Apple Jacks and Mountain Dew for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You know? Like, that's... Agreed, agreed. I, yes, yes and no to, to that certain extent. I mean, I deal with kids every single day i deal with all their fucking problems i deal with all their successes i mean when kids want to kill themselves who do the fuck do they call like they end up texting me yeah, yeah. like i've i've had more text messages than i'd like to admit regarding that yeah right so these kids with serious problems they hit me up with kids with serious successes they hit me up when they're super proud super sad super confused i mean mike i don't know what the fuck to do this girl's doing this and that like they need guidance Right. So oh, as, as the parent, yeah. All right. Hey, let's figure it out. Laissez faire, like hands off, like, let, let, but at the same time, like, nah, man. I think like, it's, it's, what, what you're describing is you're, you, you're going to give your child options and flexibility in uh, the path. But then when it comes to the pursuit and, you know, working your way down that path, it's like, nah, <laughs> you're going yeah. to push it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, of course. And that should have been prefaced because, I mean, that's the, the guidance. I mean, of course, like once they're into something, they're not going to be motivated all the time. But I've also seen on the flip side of what you're saying, Mike, I've seen it go also terribly wrong where you've got kids that are not really doing the things that they want to do, get hammered, 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 hammered. And they could have been pretty good. And then they just end up hating the whole fucking thing and hating their parents at the same time. Yeah, that was that was me and and ninety percent of people that ended up winning state championships in fucking wrestling, 
right? Which I didn't do, by the way. I ended, I ended up stop wrestling because of, of an injury, and then I ended up pursuing baseball. But what stuff like that teaches you with those overbearing parents, right? As ridiculous, and I've trained my fair share of kids with overbearing fucking parents. And as ridiculous as it is, it teaches you what real work is, right? These kids know, like, if you have these parents like, oh, man, like, this practice is nothing. My dad used to kick the shit out of me when I, when I missed a ground ball or when I, he used to make me fucking just run pass after pass after pass or, or shoot free throw after free throw after free throw, right? Like, they, you might be overbearing, but you know what real work is. And when it's time to really put in the fucking work to something that you want to do, you know exactly how to do it. So there is that other side of the coin with that overbearing fucking parent. Like, you know what real work is and you know when you're fucking cheating yourself. So I, I get it on that one side, like shit, you don't want to be too forceful, but I've seen both kids and both kids are good kids, right? It's a, but some kids make it in what they want to do and some kids don't. And the difference between the two is that fucking ability to push themselves. So- what kid might give me a simple soundbite for social media. <laughs> <laughs> and look, man, How am I'm I gonna not... fucking put that in 140 characters? <laughs> <laughs> And, and Mike, I'm not, I don't feel like um, at all dis, like disagreeing on this because the key point of what you said is really what the kid wants to do. To an extent, to an extent. Now, kids genuinely want to quit things. I've, I've had kids that genuinely wanted to quit. And I asked them, I said, do you want to do this? And they say, no. And this is a 13-year-old kid going through puberty, trying mm. to figure out life, not having that much success with girls. He's getting a little chubby because he's about to go through a fucking growth spurt, right? He's going through his awkward phase and he's got mm. braces and this and that. Like, the motherfucker don't want to do anything except play fucking Fortnite, right? Mm. So, yeah, he genuinely didn't want... And this isn't just one kid. I'm not thinking about one. There's a lot of kids like this. But they genuinely don't want to do anything. They genuinely, honest to God, would rather quit and do nothing and be fucking losers. I'm fine with that. And they mean mm. it. And they fucking mean it, Right? What is your responsibility as a parent? Well, he doesn't want to do this. No, I know what's fucking best for you, you idiot. Like, are you kidding me? Shut up. Get your fucking ass there. And if you don't, like, we're, hey, I'm going to start taking shit away. You know, like, or whatever, whatever your form of negative reinforcement is going to be in that situation. Maybe, you know, some, some light stress positions, maybe a little bit of uh, white noise. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's, that's my thought process on this too there still needs to be some kind of reinforcement to adherence of behavior in or, or, or to adherence of structure to reinforce certain behaviors. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that's a mandatory. Ah, that's, that's, yeah. Right. Yeah. Or did, yeah, did I just do that with, something at you do that with, with, with people anyway. So if I was to treat you, treat you in a way that you didn't want, you wouldn't, you would respond in a certain way to, stop encouraging that behavior from going on and it would be the same with your kids right so you do it with your girlfriend or you should do it with your girlfriend right because you want to make sure that you're encouraging the way that you would really want it to be you know it's not to be a, to be an arsehole about it but it's true you know if someone's treating you poorly you want to make sure that you that you change the way you're behaving rather than if you just allow a, a substandard act to happen you're creating a new lower standard because things continue to go in the same way. So, yeah, I don't know, man. It's hard for me because honest to God, and this is not to, 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 to be praising, but I never struggled with things. Like if I wanted to do something, I would just do it. And there wasn't, maybe it was the other way. It was just a shame I didn't have that much talent in what I was doing. Academics, I never did, never. Me neither. Physical, I refused. So. Physical, hell yeah. yeah. That's yeah. probably why I gravitated towards it because I'm, you know, it's the, the struggle. Yeah, uh, but academically, I've never been, uh, never really struggled. That was that was Seriously, actually though, like what what is better though, bilateral training or unilateral training? <laughs> <laughs> and Kier, that's 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 what I wanted to ask you right before we started going on, and you asked Brooker about his kid. Mm -hmm. Why physical preparation? Like a guy like you, we, you and I are pretty similar in the sense that you know we're highly motivated. And it's, if you tell us no, oh, it's going to be a fucking yes. You know what I mean? Like that, we are very, very similar people in that sense. And my dad is just like me. My dad was a CFO of a fucking company and he was pretty decent at math. I'm really good at math, 
and I'm just like my fucking father in a million and one different ways. There's very little doubt in my mind that I could accomplish what he did in the corporate sector. I know why I'm doing this. You're like a, a guinea John Nash. <laughs> <laughs> why, why on earth did you decide to choose strength conditioning? Because I wanted to be a professional rugby athlete and I was a terrible athlete. So I thought, you're not going to exclude me from this club. No, <laughs> for real. I'm going to be involved whether you like it or not. And I, I was. And that was more, it. More spite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, I just think, you know, I had, uh, I had a discussion with my dad the other day on the phone and we were talking about me and, and rugby and, you know, truthfully, I've not worked in rugby for two and a half years now. I've watched one rugby game just because it was on the telly. I was at my dad's house. I don't watch rugby, don't think about it, don't follow the news, anything like that because it consumed me for the best part of a decade and it defined me and I got to go very, very close to going all the way. And Japan was set up in such a way that it took every last drop of enthusiasm that I had for rugby. So I thought, right, I'm gonna, uh, for real, I'm gonna move the goalposts and go work in the NFL. And you know, I said to my dad, I said, have you ever, have you ever been in that situation? And he said, no, I've, I've not been in that situation. And then it came to me, I said, well, that's because, I, I said it to him, I don't think he liked it. I said, that's because nobody ever grew up saying, man, I cannot wait to be a logistics manager. <laughs> so it's a double-edged sword. When you have a job like that, you get to keep your hobbies, your hobbies. When your job becomes your passion and your hobby, it can flame out. And I loved sport and everything around if you've ever been to twickenham or you know you've been to like giant stadium you get in that atmosphere and you can feel it in the air and someone's going to pay you a bunch of money to do that every single week and you see like the clip of the changing room on tv and you see the boys going nuts and you get to be there in person and you grow up and you think you know, there were, there were guys in my late teens and early 20s that I saw on TV thinking, fucking hell, how does he do that? And then I find myself X amount of years later watching him do it in person. Shit that if I gave you a thousand goes, you could never do it in your freshest state with pure concentration. This guy will just do it in a game like, and you get to see that up front. You think, fucking hell. And I wanted more of that. And that was being five foot 10 and a terrible athlete and a dad bod, that's how I got there. So I did that and I had my fill. Now the goal person moved. Great answer. Great answer. So you said um, walking out into Wembley, you, you mentioned that already. What's been the, what's been the creme de la creme? That was, that was pretty heavy because when you when you have a habit of always keeping your head down and saying, right, what do I do now? What do I do now? What do I do now? You, when your focus is always on the next step and you never turn around and look at where you used to be, it was almost circuitous in a way in that I started my career in London and I was the academy guy and one of the most painful moments in my early career because I didn't have the level of self-esteem and it meant everything to me to succeed was when I was the academy intern, I'd been working there for the best part of six months. And I introduced myself to the head of strength and conditioning for the senior team. And he said, Oh, I know who you are. Why don't, why don't you fucking talk to me then prick? And that really crushed me. And it's also stuck with me for my career. I'll talk to anyone top to bottom in the organization. My interns that work for me now, I speak to them every single day. I buy them a coffee every single day. I sit with them every single week and help them not be in that situation. So to have that and then come back five years later to what at the time was a world record crowd for a rugby game against the most successful sports franchise on earth. And we didn't beat them, we came close and you feel the eyes of the world on you or what is your world 
you know, there's people that don't give a fuck about rugby. You feel the eyes of the rugby world on you and everyone's like, fuck. That kind of like circuitous route, it forces you to take stock and say, maybe I have come further. So that, that was why that sticks in my memory. Uh, you know, I used to get a Wembley as a kid as well. And uh, obviously the, the quarter final was a very, very big deal just because you know, we beat the second best team in the world by 20 points. We, we had a 17-0 lead after 13 minutes. 50,000 people had come from Ireland to that game. Roof over the Millennium Stadium. If you were stood next to me, you wouldn't be able to hear that conversation. And it was just like, the, the atmosphere was fucking electric. And then after 13 minutes, it was silent. And we were just like, fuck. <laughs> and it was good. It was good. And then a week later, I was sulking because we didn't make the final. So... It's uh, events like that, they're nice, but you shouldn't do the job for those reasons because there were a million factors that had to fall into place to allow me to enjoy that moment that had nothing to do with how well I did my job. Mm. So it's nice, but I'm not going to pursue it. And so, you know, this leads me back to, you mentioned at the beginning that there you had prepare or you planted the seed to go to exos without even realize that you did it so you sort of went into this sort of strategic mapping of how you wanted your career to go those 10 years ago on those cold nights and wasps right you what are you telling your interns or if you had to go back yourself to 10 years ago with everything that you've learned how would you sort of progress it and i mean you know go all out for this i mean because you know, you've got for sure a bunch of wisdom and it's going to be not just related to strength and conditioning, it could go into any sort of entrepreneurial yeah. act. You ever heard the phrase, dress for the job that you want? No. Yep. Behave for the job that you want. Mm. I never told anyone, but when I came in as an unpaid intern at Wasps, I used to tell myself in my head, I'm not an intern, I'm an unpaid coach. I'm going to behave like a coach. Because if you behave like an intern, they're going to see you as one. They're going to pay you as one. So you do all the shit that the other interns do, and then you go coach. You are behaving for the job that you want, and you demonstrate value. So in, in business, demonstrate value, receive reward. People flip it and say, all right, give me the reward, and then I'll show you some value. No, nah, that's not how it works. <laughs> demonstrate value, get reward. Don't get taken advantage of doing it, but that's how it works. And... I think, you know, that Ray Dalio thing of what is it that I want? What's stopping me from getting it? What's the root cause of that? What can I do right now to take that off the table? And then just keep going and going and going and going. But I think that was one thing that kind of separated me, maybe from other interns. I think it's always better to have more skill and be better at the job. But when you're an intern, you don't have that. So you just, you are just going to have to fucking work. You know, I used to do 16-hour days and uh, try and go above and beyond and do like that. But I think for my interns now, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. I think it's one of those things where, most to an extent, I think if you have to be told, that's not for you. Mm. My job is to guide you, not to tell you. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it keeps coming back to, you know, did you, did you read a lot? I know you said that you enjoyed the self-help uh, mm -hmm. industry. You exhibit a lot of good leadership traits. Is this something that you have learned through experience or through books or both or, Pain, you know, painful experience <laughs> yeah. as part of the Sydney Roosters onboarding. They, they maybe still have them. They did have a pair of clinical psychologists, father and son clinical psychologists that Crazy. screened all incoming members of staff so that you could be analyzed and they'd have a profile of you on the business. And what they said to me was that you have the psychological profile of the top 1% of earners. I thought, fucking hell. I said, ah, but you don't have the profile of the top 0.1%. And they said, because what you see is, is what you want. And then you go after it and it doesn't matter how much human debris there's going to be in the process, which 
hurts to hear. And they said, if you want to realize that true achievement and great things are built via what can you do for the organization and how can you facilitate other people to do that? That's how you get to the point 1%. Yeah. Yeah. which was a painful thing to hear. And I've continued to make mistakes in my career um, in, in that regard, but at least I'm aware of it to sure. fix it, you, to fix it. You have to be aware of it and you have to, you have to work on it. And it is, it's a challenge to, again, it's a balancing act. You've got to be great things require tough politically distasteful decisions to be made mm. it's one thing to say and when it comes time to make those decisions are you going to take you know hard choices easy life easy choices hard life yeah yeah but what i've tried to be aware of i've written i, I write this ebook 99 problems but a job ain't one Bec because of that mindset and being analytical and nothing is going to stop me every single person i used to run through a little program in my head do i work with them do i work around them do i work through them so now i just try and work with them mm. at a push i'll work around them if i have to and you know the karma of number three try and avoid yeah yeah cool yeah cool cool, cool. Cool. But that's also more into this overall leadership. It's always about the others. And it, and I mean, if you want to work on a big, a big scale, it's about, you know, if you can bring other people up, yeah, that's the true value of, uh, yeah, I think the it's self-serving, but the way that I try and choose to measure my contribution to an organization is the legacy and how many of those people that I used to work with, still contact me years after the fact mm. so london wasps i've had kids that i used to train when they were teenagers that are in the england squad now and they message me i have one come to stay with me in tokyo I'll, I'll go out have lunch with them when i'm in the uk i speak to them i speak to people at rotherham i don't speak to anyone at sydney roosters at all mm. i speak to people in argentina i speak to people in japan so it's all that kind of stuff and i think that's that's a useful measure because it means that mentally you're still in their their life and you you've kind of added and given them something that they're still using yeah. um and then in terms of organization you as you get to, get to a certain level you start to think about well you're not worried about the x's and the o's or the sets and the reps of building success because those seats on the bus are going to change just by the nature of strength and conditioning you're talking about how do you try and create an organization or a department that fosters success regardless of who are in the seats. Yeah. And when you, when you talk about that, it's like, how do you attract the best people? How do you clear the path for them so they have to focus only on their job? And then how do you convince them to stay? And when you talk about what attracts them to stay and what keeps them to stay is money, personal life, uh, sense of purpose and progression towards career goals. If you only offer money, what are they going to do the second somebody offers them more money? They're going to leave. So if you don't have money, you have to compete as hard as you can on the stuff that doesn't cost any money, which is how much do I get out of your way and let you do what it is you love to do better than anyone else? When you get out of bed in the morning, do you feel like you're making a difference and you have purpose to your life and that we're working towards a shared mission? And when you talk about professional advancement, Am I helping you become so good that you'll leave for good reasons? Mm. How few organizations do that? Few. <laughs> well, yeah. so I, I do something similar with my guys, but my goal is to constantly improve them so that they don't want to leave either. Exactly. Right? Like I, I have them in a situation where they're, I'm constantly learning. Rising tide raises all ships. So, and I can make it where each one of my guys runs their own business under my fucking roof and it's limitless. Like the sky is the no, limitless. Maybe they say, right, you know, I want to put on the big boy pants and I want to go do it elsewhere and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And it would, yeah. be, it would be great for them to go with your blessing and it just mm -hmm. say, right, it's time. It's time, you know, 
some I, I do think some people are within the context of professional sport some people are just not meant to be head strength coaches yeah there's a certain personality set there's a certain intellect and there's a certain tolerance for stress and abuse that lends itself to that and some people don't have it if you really 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 want it maybe you can force yourself to develop it but i know of other coaches just as technically accomplished as me maybe more that aren't quite as willing to put their head above the parapet and have people shoot at them and my my athletes my former you know my youth athletes they're 15 16 and they can see it and they said you know what the difference between you and other people is you don't mind the abuse. So I think, you know, there's, there are certain mentalities to that as well. I agree. So Mike brought up this up. I think it was after the second or the third podcast and you was going on about him and maybe we even chopped this bit out, but I wanted to ask you this. Yeah. You going on about this uh, mentorship yep. program. What do you... Tell me more about it. What are your ideas? Well, hours for dollars, mm. diversification. Mm. You know, when the next corona pandemic happens and you can't train people, you want to still be making money, right? Of course. Of course. Yep. yep. So scalability. If Guadango wants to train twice as many athletes, what's he going to have to do? You need double, twice as double many his hours. hours. Double his hours, yeah. yeah. Uh, if... He sends out a weekly email or a recorded call or thoughts on a topic and questions and answers and 10 people consume that, how much more effort does it take him to have 100 people do that? Mm. Zero. But his income mm. has gone up by 1,000%. It's more robust. It's a greater leverage of, of the skills and resources that he has. Uh, it makes him harder to go broke. And the point is, if he doesn't do it, someone's going to take that money and it's probably not going to be as good. So he almost has like a moral obligation to help people and not have somebody else take that money. Mm. That's, that's uh, why. But, and, and then what, what, what do you think the mentorship should revolve around? And what parts of, what parts of, of this do you think are even uh, worthy to become a mentorship program? What, what, did you, what did you struggle with as a young coach that took you a lot of time, money, and effort to solve those problems? Communication, mm. for one. So whatever the answer to that question is, yeah. your job, when, when people pay you for education, they're paying you to not have to figure it out quite so long and hard for themselves. Yeah, sure. I'm sure if we lived 10 lifetimes, we could go out and study biology and you know, trial and error and learn and all that kind of stuff. Or I can give you a grant and you can tell me. Mm. So it's time, money, and effort that people are exchanging for you to give them or for, for you to help people advance themselves closer towards their goals. Mm. So you're providing uh, the tools that people need to speed up. Because if you think about it, it's an iterative process. Why is Facebook and Google advertising so effective? Because they're learning you know, a million, billion times a day. This was better than this. Okay, refine the model, update. This was better than this, refine, update. So it doesn't matter if your model shit to begin with. It matters how quickly you're able to take information, learn from it, update the model, and repeat. You can be as shit as you want. If you learn faster than anyone else, I'm going to overtake you. So your job is to help do that. And people will pay money to do it. Yeah. Yeah. No, so, that's cool. you know, if in, in terms of the technical stuff for the business, the, the newsletter is the lead magnet where you get people to exchange their details uh, in order to gain permission to market them. Because, you know, even though it's old, email is still the most productive form of marketing to people because it costs you nothing once you get the initial details. Your podcast would be the mouthpiece 
to put yourself out there and attract people to sign up for the newsletter. I'll say it for you. Sign up to the newsletter if you're listening to this episode. <laughs> <laughs> and then once you go into that, the, the lead magnet is a greater opportunity to convey authority, value, maximize the proposition of value to, to potential clients and minimize their perception of risk. Mm. And then call to action, fulfillment. Pay me a hundred bucks a month, be part of the mentorship with that kind of stuff. I told Ooh. you, man, fucking guy, fucking guy has it. Yeah, yeah, it's good. <laughs> it's good, it's good, it's good. I know we've been going for a while. I've got one more question for you, Kier, and then I, yeah. I'm, I'm good with you. I can let you go after not seeing you for so long. What gets you excited now? Um, professionally or personally? Both. I mean, I'm, I'm excited to see my son grow up. Um, I'm excited to keep pushing myself to learn new stuff and look back on programs that I wrote six months ago and be like, why did I do that? That's not good. The second you stop doing that, you should be worried. The second you stop attending educational events where once or twice a year you feel like a fraud that's a problem um i'm applying for a green card i'm trying to become a permanent resident citizen of america because i love it here um a whole bunch of stuff i'm excited to to grow the business and keep putting myself out there and keep trying to pay it forward create what was not there for me when i developed cool yeah Cool. cool. Well, Network.com. Yeah. Any other plugs you want to say? Go go ahead. Yeah. Follow follow him at rugby strength coach. Right. Rugby underscore strength underscore coach. I tell you, hey, if you just search the word rugby strength and conditioning on Google, I'll be at the top. <laughs> oh, Johnny, fucking big dick over here. <laughs> no, no competition. <laughs> uh, nah, rugby strength coach, strength coach network. Just just search that stuff and it'll pop up. Kia, right man. And we'll great to, great to see you, bro. Good pleasure, to see you. I'm man. glad you're doing so well, man. It's been a while. You going to come visit? Well, when all of this shit yeah, you yeah. Know, goes down, for sure. For sure. I'll be over at some point. Awesome. Cool, Cheers, man. Boys. Cheers, fella. Thank you.